Delirium is a neurocognitive disorder that, according to recent evidence, affects around 35% of palliative care inpatients upon admission and up to 88% prior to death. The presence of delirium is also a predictor of adverse outcomes associated with increased short and long-term mortality and prolonged ICU length of stay. Patients with delirium present with attention and awareness deficits, which develop over a short period of time and tend to fluctuate during the course of a day. This is accompanied by other cognitive impairments such as memory deficit, disorientation, or impairment in language, visuospatial ability, or perception. They can also either be hypoactive or hyperactive, and this distinction directly impacts treatment. Now, imagine you are working in the ER when an 88-year-old female named Rose is brought in by her daughter. The patient's daughter tells you that the patient has refused to eat for the last day or two and is abnormally agitated and disoriented. What would be your first steps in providing care for this patient? The first question you should ask would be, is delirium and agitation a sign of serious illness? When you examine Rose, initial assessment must focus on evaluation for hemodynamic and respiratory stability. A very sick, critically ill patient can present with agitated delirium as a predominant symptom. Vital signs, including temperature and point-of-care serum glucose, should be obtained as soon as possible. A delirium workup usually includes blood cell counts, electrolytes, kidney and liver function, cultures, and a toxicology screen. Be sure to include a brief neurological examination with a follow-up CT scan if there is any focal neurological deficit. The ultimate priority in your treatment of any patient should be to align your plan of care with the patient's priorities and goals of care. Patients with terminal illness require a unique plan of care which will be discussed further in later lessons. The second question you should ask would be, is the agitation caused by severe pain or discomfort? If the patient is verbal, ask about physical symptoms and emotional and spiritual distress. Scales such as the Behavioral Pain Scale, or BPS, and RDOS can help identify suffering in a nonverbal patient. Non-purposeful movements, grimacing, look of fear, and increased heart and respiratory rate can suggest uncontrolled symptoms. Pain, dyspnea, constipation, and urinary retention are common and treatable triggers for agitated delirium. The acronym PINCHME summarizes common causes of delirium. It stands for pain, infection, nutrition, constipation, hydration, medication, and environment. When we consider medication, know that starting a patient on medications such as opioids and diazepines can cause delirium. Similarly, the abrupt suspension of a drug that the patient uses chronically can induce delirium and abstinence symptoms. So, how do we treat delirium? The treatment of delirium is aimed at reversing the underlying condition. Up to 50% of delirium is reversible in a hospital setting. For example, our patient Rose had severe pain in her lower abdomen. Focused ultrasound confirmed urinary retention, and a urinary catheter was placed. Rose urinated 850 milliliters in five minutes, and agitation resolved, but she was still confused. There are many non-pharmacological interventions that complement medical therapy and can benefit patients with delirium. These include monitoring cognition, mobility, sleep-wake cycles, sensory impairment, and adequate nutrition. Mobility can be improved through physical therapy and by avoiding unnecessary noises and medication administration overnight, we can better regulate sleep-wake cycles. Visual and hearing aids can reduce 
sensory impairments. Overall, the key takeaway here is to be sure to utilize all your tools as a clinician, rather than solely relying on medications. Rose's urinalysis and cultures confirmed a urinary tract infection that was treated with antibiotics. 48 hours later, Rose was significantly better and was discharged on oral antibiotics. But what about antipsychotics? Shouldn't Rose be on antipsychotics? When are they necessary? Drug treatment in delirium is aimed at reducing distressing symptoms such as dangerous agitation and hallucinations. Antipsychotics alone do not reduce delirium severity, resolve symptoms, or alter mortality. Ultimately, they have no role in the treatment of hypoactive delirium. In severe agitation, haloperidol can be used in low doses of 1 to 2 and up to 5 mg, oral, IV, IM, or SC. Milder but burdensome agitation can be controlled using oral antipsychotics, such as ketiapine, at a dose of 12.5 to 50 mg every 8 hours, or risperidone at a dose of 0.5 to 1 mg every 12 hours. Benzodiazepines have a limited role in the treatment of delirium. They are primarily indicated in alcohol and drug withdrawal, or when antipsychotic drugs are contraindicated. Physical restraints should be avoided, as they frequently increase agitation and produce additional problems. In summary, delirium and agitation are complex symptoms associated with a high risk of hospitalization and death. The main stand of treatment is to investigate and address reversible causes. Non-pharmacological measures can be helpful. Antipsychotics are reserved for agitated, hyperactive patients that could harm themselves or others. So I hope you liked this video. Absolutely make sure to check out the course this video was taken from and to register for a free trial account which will give you access to selected chapters of the course. If you want to learn how MetMastery can help you become a great clinician, make sure to watch the About MetMastery video. So thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.